Good evening. It's very good to see everyone here this evening. We want to welcome everyone here and those that are uh, uh, online. We want to welcome everyone to another installment of our summer series. Uh, Eric Rucker will be bringing our lesson this evening. Uh, the theme is Standing on the Promises, and I believe his lesson is The Promise of Christ to Build His Church. Uh, Justin McCary will be leading our songs, and at the appropriate time, Matt Walker will lead us in a closing prayer. There are still many of our congregation that are dealing with sicknesses, and, and uh, most people are in recovery, so we want to uh, thank God for that and to also continue to pray for them. Um, I do have one announcement, and that is a reminder that our Bible classes will resume on October 4th for the third through the 12th grade. And adults, um, uh, hmm. That's at night, that starts at 9 a.m. Um, let's begin with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the weather that you've sent our way for this rain. We thank you for the seasons. We thank you for all the good things that you do for us. We know that you care for us and that you love us, and we're grateful for that. We are beginning to enter into the lesson tonight. We ask that you would help us to turn our minds away from those things of the world and concentrate on your word that we might gain the most from it. We pray for those that are not able to be with us and we pray that you will continue to bless them and help them to recover. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we begin this evening, let us turn to number 500. 15, 515 on Zion's glorious summit. On Zion's glorious summit stood the numerous souls redeemed by blood. They hymned their King in strange deeds. 
next song before the lesson will be number 977. The battle belongs to the Lord, number 977. Heavenly armor will enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapons that fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory. song will be number 288. I need thee every hour, number 288. Good evening. Good to see everybody here tonight and good to have those that have joined us online. With keeping Lily every week or every other week, I'm joining these and had to stay up with this series uh, online, and it's been good to be able to do that and appreciated Tom's words last week and Brother Rob's words the week before and know that there's a lot of people out there that either can't be here but are able to watch online or are um, just needing to stay away from the virus for now and, and watching online. But we pray that you're able to be back with us very soon, as, as soon as you feel comfortable being here or as soon as you get uh, well over whatever illness you might have. And uh, if not, we'll try to come out and see you guys. Um, but let's go ahead and get into our lesson this evening. And I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, I think it's been great. We didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to do a summer series. And it's been great to have an in-house summer series. Um, this year for sure. It's been good to hear what our men have to say from God's word. Um, standing on the promises of God is the key uh, theme for the summer series, and then tonight the promise of Christ to build his church is, uh, is our theme, and um, the key passage for that comes from Matthew 16, 13 through 18 where uh, Peter's confession is and the promise of Christ, that Christ has to build his church. And so I'd like to look at that this evening and see how that might play into our lives. This promise really does affect us as the church since it's a pro his promise to build his church. So let's look at that passage together right now. 
Starting with verse 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, whom do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So Christ definitely did promise to build his church, and here it's the ecclesia, the called out, and that is what we are. And he promised to build on us or build us upon the rock. And so what does this passage really mean? And I think if you're like me, over the years you have seen this passage maybe either debated or maybe uh, talked about from what the Catholics believe to what the, what the Protestant view is or the um, traditional Christian view is. So let's look at that. The Catholic Church um, claims that the rock is Peter. And Peter, the Greek there is Petros, you are Peter, Petros, which can be translated rock, but typically it's a rock that you can pick up and throw, okay? And it's a masculine form. And the church is built, they believe that the church is built on Peter and that he was the first pope of the church. And then the traditional view says that, no, no, the rock, Petra, and that's the translation of the second, uh, second or the, the only word that's translated rock there, uh, Petra in the Greek. Uh, and that is a large mass of a stone uh, object that cannot be moved and is feminine in nature. And so uh, the traditional view says, okay, it's Petra which is Peter's confession, the confession that Jesus is the Son of God. And upon that confession, the church is built, its foundation is built in the truth, on the truth that Christ is the Son of the living God. So I'd like to, I'd like to uh, agree that that's a good way to look at this, but I think maybe there could be something more in this and what Jesus was getting at. And what I'd like to do tonight for a little bit is take the context of this verse, the setting or the place in which Jesus said this, the culture uh, that was the, at the time of Christ and what was going on in the place and what had gone on in history uh, at this place and the history of the worship practices of the day and see if maybe some of that uh, can help us determine why Jesus said the words that he said when he said them, okay? And so I'd like to take a look at a little bit of this tonight. Some of what I'm sharing is not new probably to some of you, but I definitely think it's good to look at when we consider what Jesus was trying to tell us within this promise to build his church. So let's look at the place real quick. So the place is Caesarea Philippi. And the city of Caesarea Philippi was known as the ancient city, or it had been the ancient city of Peneus. And it was situated in the north about 30 miles past the Sea of Galilee on a terrace at the foot of Mount Hermon on its southern slope. And you can see a, a little bit, Mount Hermon is over there to the right, and it's on its southern slope. And if you remember, this was the area that the tribe of Dan relocated to when they moved from below Ephraim and, and the promised territory that they had to then they went north and went ahead and settled here uh, in the city of Dan, which was about four miles from Peneus or um, Caesarea Philippi. And in 1 Kings 12... We read that Dan was the place where Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, made 
a high place and offered sacrifices to a golden calf and led Israel into idolatry. And that can be found in 1 Kings 12, 26 through 28. So that's the place. And here's another little map of where Dan came from and where they settled. Um, and you can read about that in Judges 18. And you can even read about how they couldn't hold uh, their territory because of the Philistines and others that were attacking. And they did never completely wiped out the territory that they were supposed to. Um, and you can read there in Judges 18 that when they moved up there, they actually established a carved image there. So not only did they establish a carved image, but Jeroboam did when he took over and became the first king of the, nor uh, of the northern kingdom. So a lot of um, the place, you kind of understand, but, the, but a lot of history there, too, with um, idol worship. Okay, and So let's look at the history and a little bit more about that idol worship. So the ancient Canaanites, and you can read this, but I'll read it for you. The Canaanites built a sanctuary to Baal at Peneus. And their belief was that every year Baal went down to the underworld to a place called Hades where he would spend the winter and hopefully come back in the spring. Okay? And um, he was a fertility god. And Baal, in this sense, can be referred to as Beelzebub, um, the lord of the underworld, or the god of the dead, or the god of Hades, or hell, also known as the devil. And so there's definitely a correlation between Baal and the devil, uh, being the lord of the underworld. So Caesarea Philippi had been, and still was, at the time of Jesus, a religious center. It was in this area that there was an enormous amount of water. And in fact, it was the main source of the Jordan River. And it's a cave, it was a cave, that, uh, where water sprang up. And um, I think I'll have a little bit more about that, so I'll stop there. But to a pagan mind, water means fertility. And so when you see the water, and I know that's probably what they were doing when Dan established uh, a, a location there, when the um, Canaanites uh, were there, when Jeroboam set up a high place, it was all because of this source of water that was feeding the Jordan, okay? And it was actually coming up from the ground or from the underworld, as they might have thought, okay? So let's take a look a little bit at the, more at the history. So this is a drawing of what they believe Peneus probably looked like at the time of Christ in the first century, okay? So again, this is Caesarea Philippi, okay? And this is what they think it looked like. And you can see there, there's a huge mass rock wall sitting there with carved images in the wall. And then you can also see on the, the building to the left, the large temple area where there's a cave there and that is where the spring was and this whole temple and their whole structure was built around this this water that was there believed to be um, you know f meant for fertility and there's also high places you can see over there on the right and steps going up where they could have high places to uh, to some of these the idol worship that was going on there so let me read you a little bit while the worship of Baal had pretty much fizzled out in the first century the Greeks and Romans had both built sanctuaries there because of the cave of Pan and Pan in Greek mythology he's referred to as a, he's a fertility god who is whose chief concern was with the flocks and herds and was seen to give fertility in the season of spring he was considered to be the god of theatrical criticism. Our word panic ultimately derives from the god's name, all right? So this god's name, Pan, and that's where the city of Paneus, that's where the word, the, the city's name came from as well. Inside the cave, you see over here on the left, um, and I'm going to show you pictures of what it looks like today. Um, inside the cave, you see the backside of the temple uh, was, was a seamless, seemingly bottomless pit with an unlimited quantity of water which made the Paneans marvel. 
okay? So here's an excerpt from Josephus, a historian of that day. And when Caesar had further bestowed upon him, speaking of Philip, Herod's son, which Caesarea Philippi was named after, another additional country, he built there also a temple of white marble hard by the fountains of the Jordan, the place is called Panium or Paneus or Caesarea Philippi, where is a top of a mountain that is raised to an immense height and is at its side beneath or at its bottom a dark cave opens itself within which there is a horrible precipice that descends abruptly into the of vast depth. It contains a mighty quantity of water which is immovable and when anybody lets down a cord, sorry, when anybody lets down anything to measure the depth of the earth beneath the water, no length of cord is sufficient to reach it. Now the fountains of the Jordan rise at the roots of this cave outwardly, and some think it is the utmost origin of the Jordan. And that's in Josephus, The Wars of the Jews, 1, 2, 21, 3. So when Herod the Great died in 4 BC, there was an area, the area was passed on to the son Philip the Tetrarch, and he was made ruler over the regions. And Philip the Tetrarch rebuilt the city of the ancient Peneus and made it much more large and beautiful and changed its name to Caesarea Philippi in honor of the Caesar, Tiberius at the time, and himself, of course. Um, and he depicted uh, the shrine of Pan and on his coins, of which some have survived. And Josephus said, Philip also built Peneus, a city at the fountains of the Jordan, and named it Caesarea. And that was in Antiquities 18.1. So that's kind of the history of what the city looked like, the city of Caesarea Philippi, at the time of Christ. Okay, and it's interesting to note that Caesarea Philippi isn't really mentioned in the scripture except during this discourse that Jesus gave and that Jesus talked to, Philip, uh, to Peter about his confession. Okay, so it obviously was probably a chosen destination for this discourse. Um, a little bit further about the history, these are some pictures that my dad took when he was in uh, Israel. And this is what it looks like today. So you can see the carved out spaces in the rock that are still there. And that was depicted in the picture or the painting on the previous slide. And then some of the temple um, columns or pillars were there um, at, you know, or, and are still there. And you can actually see some of the rocks or the stairs of the high places that they had there as well. And then um, here's some other pictures that he took. Um, and this um, sign here actually says... Uh, kind of goes through a little bit of the history, and I'd like to read you what this says. You may not be able to see it um, with the naked eye. It says, this inscription reads, the cave is the nucleus beside which the sacred sanctuary was built. In this abode, quote, abode of the shepherd god, Pan, a pagan cult began as early as the third century. The ritual sacrifices, often human, were cast into a natural abyss reaching the underground waters at the back of the cave. If the victims disappeared in the water, this was a sign that the God had accepted the offering. If, however, signs of blood appeared in the nearby springs, the sacrifice had been rejected. So that's kind of what we're dealing with in the city of Caesarea Philippi from a perspective of the culture and the pagan images that were being worshipped at the time. Um, here's a little bit further uh, uh, picture, kind of further back, um, of what it looks like today. And you can see the cave there where the water came out, gushing out to supply the Jordan River. And you can see the, um, the uh, massive rock formation there that's above where the temple set and where this cave is. And in the 1800s, there was a uh, massive earthquake that actually moved the location of the water and the springs out to kind of the way you see them now and away from the cave, okay? And so that's kind of have to know that in history too because the water's not gushing out of the cave today. So um, in Caesarea Philippi, 
Caesarea Philippi was the location of the cave of Pan, the place known as the gates of Hades, uh, the way to the underworld. This was also the same place where the Greeks and Romans received revelations from the god Pan, who was mentioned in classical writings as a seer or fortune teller and of a given a giver of revelations or of revelations um, and then this rock mass or wall um, I, I'm pointing this out now not history but I'm pointing this out um, this rock wall definitely could have been translated Petra okay because it's definitely what it is is a rock wall mass um, and so you know that that Greek word meaning a stone a solid stone mass that could not be easily moved, okay? And so what have we learned from this study of context of the place, the history, and the culture um, of the setting? Well, we know from a place perspective that it was a worship center and that it was an area of fertility or seen as an area of fertility. We know that it was a location of the sanctuary of Pan and high places. Uh, we know that from history, um, there was a lot of idol worship there, not only the uh, Canaanites, but also the Israelites and the Greeks and the Romans. And it was also a place of sacrifice. Um, it was a place of sacrifice recognized because of its amazing water source. And then the culture, we understand that the rock wall housed many of the idols worshipped by the pagans there in the first century. And there in the first century, it did have water flowing out of the cave and was understood to be the way to the underworld. So again, I think it's important to point out, again, that Caesarea Philippi is where Jesus took them to have this discourse. So thinking about what we've learned, let's go back and read again from Matthew uh, 16 through 18, okay? And let's take, let's take what Jesus says here and let's take it step by step. So starting with verse 16, <clears throat> Simon Peter to Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So with what we know, think about Peter proclaiming that Christ is the living God. So if you were here at Caesarea Philippi during this time, the temple to these gods was there, and there was sacrifices to these idols and to, to Pan, the god of fertility, the shepherd god of fertility, Peter here is definitely making a contrast to who Christ is. He's the son of the living God, not a dead God, right? So it was definitely a contrast between the pagan idols and the fertility gods of that day when he proclaimed this. And in verse 17, And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say that you are Peter... And upon this rock, so if we look at this rock, we definitely think it could be the confession that he just said, but it, it, in, the, in, the, in light of the context of where they are, um, when, when he's saying it, it definitely could mean upon this rock that represents all that is, all that is evil, all that is immoral, the rock that represents idol worship, the rock that represents that represents uh, pu putting to death sacrifices to 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 unknown gods, so that they can see if the if if the sacrifice will be accepted, so they can see if the god Pan or the god Baal will come back in the spring and and bless them, and so I think the the rock uh, definitely could be the idea of what the rock there at Caesarea Philippi uh, represented. 
And I think what he's saying is the church will be built upon this rock. It will be greater than this rock, and it will and Christ will put this underfoot, and we will build the foundations of the church upon this rock. Okay, and um, if you don't believe that this is the context, or if this is really what maybe he's saying, you know, we all we have to do, I think, is is continue to read. Bear with me one second. So if you look at what he says next, there in uh, chapter in, in uh, verse eighteen, he says, "But my Father who is in heaven, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it." The gates of Hades contrasting the idolatry, saying that the idolatry will not stand. Death and Hades will be conquered in victory. And so I definitely think that the choice words that Jesus chose here as the gates of Hades will not prevail against it was quite odd unless you think about the context of Caesarea Philippi at this time and think about that rock image and think about that uh, cave known as the gates of Hades the passage to the underworld and you think about these things and you say hmm that might actually have some bearing upon what Jesus was talking about here and so I think there are too many similarities um, to say that this was just by chance that Jesus chose these words so these are some of the lessons I think we can get from what Jesus Uh, And this discourse was telling his disciples. But there's one last thing that I want to focus on for the the duration of the lesson. And that is what he says, you know, in this final section. He says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And I don't know about you, but I've heard different things taught about what that really means. And what the gates of Hades overpowering the church really means. Um, And so when you think about, I'd like you to think about that image in this context, but when you think about the gates of Hades and how they they might be, uh, they might not prevail against the church, I'd like for you to think about what gates do. What do gates do? And oftentimes I think we've thought about these gates encroaching like this picture the evil encroaching upon the church, if you will. And um, I think that maybe there is something to be said about that, and and the the Bible does talk a lot about guarding ourselves, right, And, and standing firm. Ephesians 6 will talk about standing firm. Um, But I think that we have to ask ourselves, what do gates do? Do they attack Or do they protect? Do they actively pursue or do they keep in things? Okay? And so I think we have to ask ourselves what the church's relationship is to those gates. And again, the church is translated here, ecclesia, or the called out. And so I would like to suggest that What Jesus is saying here is upon this terrible idol worship unrighteous setting I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it in fact prevail just means overcome or the word translated here actually means is stronger than okay and so it means that the gates of hell are not stronger than the church and in fact I think a lot of times we try to say as the church we're going to guard against the gates attacking us but gates don't attack what do they do they protect so what is the church to be doing upon the gates of hell I believe we're to be attacking 
okay? And there's something to be said about what Christ is saying here, building his church upon this idea and then attacking. And so we've all seen that song, The Lord's Are Me, don't we, Jonah? We sing, The Lord's Are Me, and we sing, The battle belongs to the Lord today. And we know that God is definitely a warring God, as some of the scripture will look at say. But we may need to change the game in the church. Instead of guarding what we have, we may need to start looking like we're attacking. And I know this isn't a new concept, but sometimes we forget. And here it's like Christ is saying that he will build his church upon the rock of perversion, and we as the church will fight to overpower it and overcome it. And in Ephesians 6, it says we wrestle against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil. Is that what was happening at Pan, at the city of Pan, Caesarea Philippi? It sure is. It's exactly what was happening. And against Baal and against Pan, it could read, and against Pan and against Baal and against whatever is wrong in our culture today. And I believe we need to think about being on the attack, being on the charge. And the question becomes, do, well, do we really see Christ talking about that in any other instances within um, the New Testament? And the answer is yes. In fact, this is kind of a busy chart that I put together here, but, G the, but Jesus himself talks about conquering, overcoming, and being victorious. Those, that's, there's one word there in Revelation but that's basically the translation, and some of the translations read conquer, some of them read overcome, and some of them read uh, victorious or victors, um, and so be victorious over. And so what, what Christ does in Revelation is he talks to the seven churches, and he doesn't leave one church out with this command, with this promise. He says, for those that overcome, for those that conquer, for those that are victorious— I will Ephesus eat the tree of life. I will, you will be able to eat the tree of life. Smyrna, you will not be hurt by the second death. Pergamum, you will receive hidden manna and a white stone. Thyatira, you will see, receive authority and the morning star. Sardis, Sardis, if you overcome and are victorious, you will be clothed in white garments and the, and the name, your name will be written in the book of life. Philadelphia will become a pillar in the temple of God, and their names will, uh, the name of God will be written on them. And Laodicea, the promise to them, if they overcame, was to sit down on Jesus's throne. Okay, Revelation three twenty one. And so there's the passages there that talk about this. But you can go through and read in Revelation two and three the promise that Christ makes to those churches who overcome and who are victorious over. All of the issues that were going on at the time against Satan and his wiles. And so I think the idea is that if we conquer, that if we overcome and are victorious, we will have life. That's what all these things mean. You're conquering death. You're conquering Hades. Hades represents death. Okay? And we can help conquer. And even that's in, in this... Um, we can study more about, but the next passage there talks about whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth and whatever you bind on earth, it will be bound in heaven. And I believe that there's something to be said about Christians attacking the wiles of the devil, attacking idolatry, attacking the things that we put before God and bringing people that are destined and on their way to death where they don't have the ability to overcome the second death, which is hell, and bringing them back and loosening their chains and, and saving them from their fate, okay? And, um, and so I think that's some of what Jesus is trying to teach Peter in this passage, but also the seven churches that are in Revelation. So the other thing I wanted to kind of show you was it's not just Jesus in the, the great con, con, confession here of Peter. It's not just Jesus to the seven churches, but it's also ideas that are brought out um, in the Gospels. If you look at James 4 and then 17, it says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
So it's an act of resistance to, keep, to, to the one who knows to do the right thing for the one who knows to do the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Again, an active participation in doing the right thing. We're not just saying no, we're actually going forward and, uh, and doing things for the cause of Christ. Romans 12, 20 through 21, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so, in, in so doing you will reap burning coals on his head do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good how do we attack the gates of hell the gates of hades we attack it by doing good and overcoming the evil with good second corinthians 10 3 through 6 the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Is that what they were doing at Caesarea Philippi? Yes, that's what they were doing. But we are destroying those things and we are raising them up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And I think some of those things that we're binding on earth are some of those things that we're taking captive and saying, we're not going to allow this to destroy us. We're not going to allow this to destroy the church that Christ promised. And then Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, and here's the, uh, the, the spiritual um, armor of God. Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I as boldly as I ought to speak. And so to me from the church's perspective from these verses from what he said to to Peter and the, the apostles to what he said to the seven churches I think we can definitely say that the church should be working to overcome to working to destroy Satan to take captive those thoughts, to boldly proclaim the word of God in the face of tyranny or in the face of persecution. So we have to be ready to take on our mission to overcome the culture and society in which we live in. And so the mission of the church, I think, in this context, um, how do we take on the gates of hell or the gates of of Hades, do we have a defensive strategy? Okay, and a defensive strategy might be we establish Christian schools to shelter our children. We establish Christian universities as places and, and hold them up as places where we can dodge getting involved with the world. We establish church buildings where we can come and safely meet in comfort away from the world. Okay, so that's one way to look at a strategy of building the church. But another way might be an offensive way, where Christian schools become a training ground for our young people to challenge society, to teach them to challenge society, identifying and fighting against every lofty thing that is raised up against true knowledge. Or building up churches where their places and I would say a people, the church that called out are a people, but our buildings are places where people are trained to go out and take on the devil, working to lead our neighbors, coworkers, family, and friends to Christ in true obedience. And I think sometimes we do this, right? And we sing this little Christian light of mine, and I'm going to go out into the world and, and teach. But I think we have to actively be seeking out those things in culture which are diametrically opposed to the word of God and say, we're not going to take this anymore. And um, instead of saying and standing back and saying, just say no or just say no to drugs, we actually teach our children not only that, but to actually take 100 no's before you move on to the next potential convert, right? And so you can, you can see where both are, are, say, are learning to say no, but one of them is learning to actively pursue the things of righteousness and actively pursue conquering the devil. And so as a church, are we doing more 
to combat Satan in the world than the same number of people are doing to combat the church, religion, morality, and the truth. So if you think about how many people are in this congregation, and then you think about the activists that we might see on TV and what they might be trying to accomplish, and that, are, that is not for truth, that is against the truth, that is, that is a lie, that is, that is uh, building up themselves instead of building up the Lord. So if we take what they're doing and we compare it to what we're doing to fight against that, who's on the winning side of that? And oftentimes I think we try to guard and we try not to say anything or do anything as the church because we don't want to offend and we don't want to maybe get involved. But when it comes to spiritual warfare, we, we must get involved. And we have to decide what those things are. But I would, I would say that oftentimes those that are pushing Satan's agendas are winning when we compare how many people are pushing that to compare to how many people, the same number of people trying to push and go out into all the world and teach the gospel like we find in, in Matthew 18. So this is kind of what I wanted to talk to you tonight about. I hope it's been, um, I hope it's been uh, profitable. Uh, I hope it's uh, maybe opened our eyes a little bit to maybe what the promise of the church uh, that Christ established, uh, what he was really looking for when he said, hey, the gates of hell or the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Okay, I'm not going to let hell win. I'm going to conquer. We're going to conquer together sin and death. And I believe there's something to be said about that when we think about what it meant for him to promise to bring the church that we are currently a part of. And so we have a part to play in that. So um, there was a part in here that I did not read through, and I want to do that now because I've got just a, a little bit of time. Um, I wanted to read you the words of a couple of songs um, that you're probably familiar with. So when we were talking about overcoming and becoming victorious, um, it reminds me of a couple of songs. And one of those is We're More Than Conquerors. And if you'll listen to this, you'll kind of see um, the thought that I think Christ was pr trying to portray to not only Peter but to the seven churches when he's talking about overcoming and conquering. And we know that that is our mission, and that is his mission, but we can't do it by ourselves. And he is the chief cornerstone that has built the church, built the church, and I think he can um, help us do that. He is, uh, he will make us victorious. And so listen to the words of, of the, uh, the chorus here of More Than Conquerors, and a lot of you are familiar with this song. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant. And that reminds me of, you know, of, of this, this picture. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins. O oh Lord, our God, our conqueror. And then the prelude there says, Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable. With you, we are victorious. And it's because of Christ that we're victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark. With you, we are victorious. You're greater than the dark, right? And that's the whole idea here, that we're trying to overcome the darkness in the world and be the light. Like Matthew 5 says, we are the city on a hill. Right? And everyone who sees us uh, sees the darkness, but they can see the light upon the hill. And we can't put a bushel over that or a bowl over that light because we won't be effective any longer. So the other verse is here in my last slide, or the other song is here in my last slide um, when we talk about our invitation tonight. So you may be familiar with Exodus 15 and the song of Moses. And in Revelation 15, uh, it talks about the song of Moses and the Lamb. And you remember we sing that song, uh, the song of Moses and the Lamb, and live and with Jesus evermore. <laughs> okay, we will rest in the fair and happy land by and by, right? 
Um, and so that's what that song is talking about, is the song of Moses and the Lamb. Well, the song of Moses is here in Exodus 15, and here's some of the things that the song of Moses talks about when it's talking about the victorious God that just led them through the Red Sea, okay? He has triumph triumphed gloriously. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The Lord is a man of war. Your right hand, O Lord, dashes the enemy in pieces. You have overthrown those who rose against you. Fear and dread will fall on them by the greatness of your arm. And so here it says, the Lord is a man of war. And I, I really think that that is um, what he is. Um, give me one second. Um, and this song, this this uh, song, the song of Moses, uh, was also redone um, into a, a new song called the Song of Moses as well. And a cappella praise and harmony, like the We Are More Than Conquerors, also does this song. Um, called the Song of Moses, and so if you want to listen to that, you may want to write that down, but here's the words to that song. It says, O Lord, our strength and song, our highest praise to him belongs. Christ the Lord, the conquering king, your name we raise, your triumph sing. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand we stand in victory, and by his name we overcome. And so these are the words to this song, again, telling us who it is that is able to overcome. Think about 1 Corinthians 15 and, and death, where is, your victory? where is your victory, right? Death, where is your sting? Well, Christ has overcome death, and Christ has overcome the world. And we will fight to help him overcome that and our war is against those principalities and rulers in the in the heavenly places in the in the dark places right that is who we are fighting against but we will not overcome without him and so what i would say tonight in in way of invitation is i would say that there it may be that you as a member of the church may not have been actively pursuing attacking the things of Satan attacking the things maybe in your life attacking the things maybe in culture uh, attacking things that you see that your children are either viewing or watching or coming up against and it may be time for us to take a stand it may be time for us to say no more, but we are more than conquerors through Christ, and we're going to take a stand, and he is going to enable us to do that. And in that way, we become the Lord's army. We become an effective church for him, the one that he built by his blood. And, um, and in that way, we can overcome. And so I think sometimes we might get discouraged, uh, but I think... By way of invitation, I just want to say that, you know, if, if that's you and, and you feel like um, you've not been doing what you need to do when it comes to, um, to serving God in this way and to overcoming and resisting uh, the evil one, um, then, you know, I think now, now's a good time to respond. And I think, um, I think we also have to understand, though, that we have to have Christ in our lives and he can help us to overcome. And, and so there may be those of you tonight that don't have Christ in your life and, and need to uh, put him on in baptism and in obedience. Um, take your faith and make it an obedient faith and, um, and put him on and be raised to walk a new life and be born again, as, it said, as he told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. So if you have any need like that tonight, I'd invite you to come as we stand and sing. As we, as we sing, but not stand.
It's good to see everyone tonight. Um, I echo uh, Brother Eric's remarks, and uh, thank you for your, your message and your, and your preparation, Eric. Uh, that it's, it has been great that we've continued our tradition of the summer series, and it's been uh, wonderful to hear uh, lessons preached about the promises of God coming from uh, the men uh, of this congregation. So um, we continue to, uh, we'll continue to be doing that in the next few weeks. Uh, on next month, uh, starting October 4th, which is the first Lord's Day in October, we return more to our, not only to our regular order, but we will uh, be introducing uh, lessons for our young people again and our adults at nine o'clock on Sundays and also uh, young people will start their classes on Wednesdays as well. So we look forward to that. We ask for your prayers and your uh, efforts to make that success. Again, good to see everyone. Uh, we have many of our number who are sick and afflicted. We also have many of our number who are recovering. So let's continue to be prayerful. Let's continue to be helpful where we can. Uh, and we'll meet again, Lord willing, this Lord's Day, uh, 10 o'clock on Sunday. Uh, Brother Walker will come and dismiss us with the benediction. Please bow with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have blessed us with. Lord, we thank you that we have this opportunity to come together as your children to open your word and to study it. Lord, we ask that you be with us and help us to use the words that we heard here today, that we may go out and we may be the light of this world and that we may fight against those sinful things. Lord, we ask that you be with those that are leading this country and other countries throughout the world. But Lord, we ask that you help us remember that our hope is not in a nation, our political party, but our hope is in the church. And Lord, we ask that you help us to go out and show the world that it's your church that matters. Lord, we ask that you give us this strength that we may complete this week as the example that you would have us to be. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.